of them. So you can go back and watch the talks themselves and listen to any of the discussion that happened afterwards if you are interested. So um, that's all I have really in the way of introduction to this, um, to say uh, what we are. Uh, I will certainly say, and I'll probably ask again at the end, if you have a, um, a project that you're doing at NERSC uh, that really kind of fits into this um, area, please, by all means, let me know. Uh, we'd love to get another scheduled list of um, talks together so we could kind of continue this series uh, maybe a little bit later in the fall. I think it was very useful. So with that, I am going to go ahead and jump into my talk, which happens to be the first talk in this kind of lightning round talk series. So what we've asked is all the people who gave talks during the regular session this um, couple of months that were users, external users, to come give a summary of those talks. So they gave more extended versions during the, um, the, the meetings. But here we wanted just to give some brief summaries. And we kind of decided that we wouldn't have the nurse staff repeat their talks because a lot of that information may come out in the other talks they were giving uh, in the, uh, the plenary part. So this is a talk that I gave initially in, uh, at CHEP conference in Adelaide last November. I recycled it for the uh, special interest group and I'm recycling it yet again here, but I've taken out some slides to try to make it shorter. Um, so apologies to those who've had to hear this at least three times now. Uh, not much information has changed. Um, just to tell you a little bit about the, the project, we're a, a nuclear physics um, experiment that's being done at Jefferson Lab. That's in the southeast corner of Virginia here, uh, kind of nestled between Virginia Beach, Norfolk, and Williamsburg. Um, we're about a uh, three and a half hour drive up to Washington, DC. Um, this is uh, an experiment that I'm going to talk about where we uh, are using NERSC for. It's called GLUEX. It's being run in one of the four experimental halls there are at the accelerator. Uh, the facility Jefferson Lab has is primarily centered on an electron accelerator, uh, which is buried underground. And you can kind of see the access buildings here giving you an idea of the shape of this. It's really two linear accelerators coupled together with magnets. So the beam can go around a few times. Three of the experimental halls are buried underground here in these round mounds. The fourth one where GLUEX is housed is up on the other side over here. And I won't go into a lot of detail of the experiment uh, itself since we just don't have time. But I will say something about kind of just the scale. Um, this, is a, this slide is getting really kind of old and I need to go through and update the numbers. But the, the main thing to look at here is over on the far left uh, for our high intensity running that we expect to produce on uh, around several petabytes of data a year from this experiment. Uh, and the data will be taken over um, several weeks. This might be taken over you know, 30 weeks of the year the accelerator may be on. Um, we'll uh, acquire the data, we'll store it, and then when we do processing of it, uh, we may have to do a couple of passes on it and um, we store some uh, processed information that itself will uh, add up to a few petabytes of information. Uh, there's quite a bit of um, uh, CPU power that's required to do the processing of this data. And this was an estimate of that at one point in time. I think that's actually gone up because uh, as you go through time, people only try to improve the code and most of that improvement makes it give better answers, not necessarily make it run faster. So the way that we do this, uh, we, we actually do offsite processing from the lab in a few different places. We, we have our own uh, scientific computing farm um, at Jefferson Lab, and it's I got you know on the order of 10,000 cores in it, so it's you know it's not tiny, but it's not really enough to do everything we need to. So we have branched out to try to do as much as we can in offsite facilities, uh, including the Open Science Grid, NERSC, and the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center, and we've tried to homogenize as much as possible uh, what's needed in order to run jobs at these different places. Um, so we do have a Docker container that we made. It's a very thin container. Uh, we use a one-line conversion to create a singularity container out of it, and a one-line convert, or just to import it into Shifter, so, um, so we don't have to do any modifications to the container itself. It's, it's thin in that it only has a couple of um, system-installed packages in it. It doesn't contain our software at all. So we've been able to use the same one for, I think, a couple of years now without having to modify it. 
Uh, the way we get our software is through the CVMFS, the CERT, uh, I guess it's a virtual, virtually managed file system or virtual machine file system. Uh, it's um, basically a, a file system where you can uh, publish your, uh, your files, in, these, in this case binaries, um, and that can be then mounted and read like it's locally mounted as a remote file system, kind of like NFS, except for it's, it's read only where you're um, operating on it from, but that's fine for what we want to do. So we do all of our software builds using CentOS 7. Our Docker container is based on CentOS 7. Uh, we put third-party software like Root, which is a product from CERN. Uh, all of our calibration constants go into an SQLite file that is also stored on CVMFS and other resource files like uh, large magnetic field maps and material maps also go there. So they're all kind of published out that way. And they're all considered kind of more or less static information. The calibration constants database does get updated and every night at midnight we generate a new SQLite file from our MySQL database, which is the definitive source and hosted at JLab. But we don't want all of our jobs that are running off site to reach back to the JLab database server. So we just distribute the, uh, the calibration process this way. Um, data transport uh, to both NERSC and, um, and PSC, we use Globus. Uh, this down here in the bottom is a graph of when we first finally got um, high throughput on uh, ESNet from JLab to NERSC. Uh, it took a little bit of effort from our IT and network guys working with um, the, uh, the guys over at, um, at NERSC to get this all working and ESNet, but uh, it, it all fin finally finished. Um, processing, all our data goes to tape. We don't have enough disk space to store it all. Uh, we have to have a workflow system that pulls it off of tape through our data transfer node to the NERSC data transfer node to Corey and then brings all the resulting files back so we can store them on tape. So we have to, I never submit a job to Slurm directly. I only submit to our workflow system, which then only submits to Slurm once the file is there ready to go. So it, it gets a little complicated. Um, and I guess I can skip over this. Uh, it just shows that we have uh, multi-threaded processing that scales. Uh, this is from last year. We uh, made most of our jobs run through backfilling um, this is just a statement. It's a little controversial maybe, but extremely poorly matched to our job shape is the scheduler at NERSC. Uh, two jobs at one time are most free of priority and all others must go in through backfill. And it treats uh, large jobs. If I want 64 job nodes for 48 hours, it treats that as one job, just like one node for three hours. So uh, it's really hard for us to compete uh, if we're doing single jobs like this. Um, we were able to do a lot with backfilling though last year, uh, asterisk, um, where we were able to get about a thousand jobs per day through when we were running smooth on Cori 2, which was plenty for us and it was very, we were pretty successful on using it. Um, so I guess I should jump to my summary now, I'm kind of at the end of my time, but we are running at NERSC with uh, large experimental nuclear physics data. Uh, the backfilling saved us, but the asterisk there is that this is really no longer true in 2020. And I think this has to do with what Sudeep may have said this morning on, uh, they got 10% more out of uh, K&L and that's to our detriment because now they don't have big holes for us to go in and fill anymore. And so it's, uh, it's hard for us to um, you know, get, get much throughput on it this year. So we're doing things to try to adjust for that. But, okay, that's all I have. And so, I've kind of run out of my eight minutes. Um, I suppose I should jump over now to the next person who's supposed to talk. And um, I think that's Steven, right? Uh, yes. So go ahead and take it over. Okay. Um, um, hi, so I'm Steven Bailey. I'm the data management lead for the Dark Energy Spectroscopic Instrument. We're making a 3D map of the universe using NERSC as our primary computing center. Um, I'm going to be focusing on the computing part, not the science part, um, but briefly describing what we do at NERSC, some challenges we've had, and some successes that we've had. Uh, so first of all, just the basics of what we do at NERSC. On a nightly basis, we have a process running on a workflow node that every 10 minutes R syncs new data from our telescope at Kitt Peak in Arizona to NERSC. Once it's at NERSC, we're using 10 nodes of the real-time queue to be processing the data 
and that way we can keep up with the data throughout the night and have the results from each night ready by breakfast time for the people who were not staying up during the night at the telescope. So we can analyze it during the day and then that informs the following night's observing plan. And then we repeat this nightly for five years and that builds up a 3D map of around 50 million objects. Um, and so it's, it's hundreds of gigabytes per night and we expect that over the next five years to grow to a scale of sort of 10 petabytes and using around 100 million hours per year um, in the next five years. Um, sorry, spam call coming in on my phone, we're shutting that off. Um, so then on a monthly or yearly time scale, um, we have reprocessing runs that use the latest tagged code starting from the raw data. Um, this uses the same code as the nightly processing, but it's at, at very different scaling needs. And this is the primary reason why we're um, working at NERSC. If we were just trying to keep up with the data with 10 nodes, we just buy 10 nodes and be done with it. But it's the fact that we sometimes need to do sort of a burst of processing years worth of data as rapidly as possible that drives us to wanting to use an HPC center. Um, but we also benefit from the one-stop shopping for having our daily processing, these big processing reruns, and the final science analyses all in one location, unlike some predecessor experiments where they do the processing at one site and then ship the results to a different site for doing the final science analysis. Um, so where we sit in big large-scale user projects, you know, horizontally is allocation in millions of hours, vertically is storage in terabytes. We're not the largest allocation, we're not the most data, but sort of along the diagonal, we're in the top five for just, you know, big data and big computing. Um, wanted to give a shout out to Debbie for emphasizing that for a lot of these projects, it's about much more than just flops and IO bandwidth. That's very true for us. Um, it's, you know, we use all of the different queues, all of the different IO systems. We use the workflow nodes, we use Jupyter, we have, you know, spin services, multiple different spin services, cron jobs. Um, so we're, we're everything that Debbie said, yay. <laughs> um, one of the key challenges that we face is queuing the complex dependencies. This is showing a cartoon version of the processing needs for one night of data where each box is representing kind of a task that needs to be computed vertically the size of the box is representing time needed and horizontally is the number of nodes and so we have sort of some calibration data that's kind of big and then it gets collated together in a small job and then some big jobs and then a small job and then a bunch of small jobs and then a bunch of big jobs and then a bunch of medium jobs and then it ends with kind of a big and that's one night worth of data and you know, sort of the naive version of each of these boxes represents a job. Rerunning five years of data would be like 200,000 jobs with interdependencies, and that's just not a slurm queuing best practice. Um, and so figuring out how to put these pieces together when they are different shapes, and it's not just like a big bag of tasks that kind of are all the same. Um, that's been one of our biggest challenges. Um, so um, our first attempt was bundling each step over about a week's worth of data, where we take a bunch of these small tasks, put them together into one job, a bunch of these larger tasks, put them into another job, chain them together. Um, this gave us big HPC-like jobs. It's the most efficient packing in theory, and when it works, it works great. But it still requires hundreds of jobs, and as David mentioned, only two of which are priority scheduled, and the remainder don't backfill very well. Job B doesn't start aging until job A is finished, and it's coupling otherwise completely independent tasks, which resulted in a lot of fragility of just like one rank can take down all ranks and um, mess things up. So our next attempt was to sort of reshape B a bit, pack them all together into one job, accept the inefficiencies of, you know, portion, portions of the time we're not using all the nodes. This gets us a faster end-to-end -end subs for a subset of the data, um, but it's, you know, it decouples the independent data, it matches well what we do throughout the night, but it's not going to scale up to five years worth of data processing. Um, so we're, we're still working on how to do this well. Um, the, the special interest group talks were helpful for learning our options, um, but, you know, it boils down to also that only two priority scheduled jobs is a big limit on experimental data processing especially when we're running these on behalf of hundreds of users, other projects might even be doing it on thousands of users. I'm, 
I'm wondering whether, you know, experimental facilities should be advocating for getting more than just two slots. And it is somewhat ironic that an HPC center has scaling problems with its scheduler. Um, so, you know, speaking to the, the NERSC folks on the line, you know, investment here with SCEDMD could help improve the effective use of future systems if SLRM itself could scale up better. Um, but I want to end on some positive stuff. So um, successes, one thing that's worked well for us is testing at NERSC. Um, we have a simple but effective nightly cron job that just does a git pull of all of our repos. It runs the unit tests to confirm not just that it works on some Travis CI configuration, but that it actually works at NERSC. Um, this is especially important, you know, after an upgrade or something. Um, and it also runs a basic integration test. Um, quarterly, we have software releases that we use Jupyter Notebooks to orchestrate the end-to-end -end integration. Some of that's running on Jupyter itself. Some of that's spinning off batch jobs, waiting for them to finish and come back. Um, and so a question to NERSC is how will they be supporting continuous integration testing on GPUs? Um, we'll definitely want some sort of equivalent of that um, once you know, the GPUs are deployed. Something that's a success, but it's more of a, a work in progress, but wanted to seed an idea, um, is the idea that we should be investing as much effort into easy recovery from problems, not just avoiding problems in the first place. As the various experimental facility you know, groups were giving their talks in the, the previous series, it seemed common that there was sort of order 1% transient job failures um, was kind of common. And even if you're doing like 10 times better than that, you know, point, you know, 0.1% failures, but you're processing a million images, that's still a thousand failures. That's more than human can easily handle if the recovery requires custom handwork. And so, you know, something we've come to realize is that we want to make that easy to recover from, not just putting all of our effort into avoiding the problem in the first place. Um, and then also wanted to give a shout out to NESAP, which has been really great. Um, you know, a single full-time postdoc plus some part-time you know, senior consulting has resulted in huge speed ups for us. So thanks to the NESAP team. Um, so with my last bit of time, um, you know, we're making a 3D map of the universe using NERSC as our primary computing center. It's that yearly reprocessing that drives the need for HPC, but we're also benefiting from that one-stop shopping aspect. Um, we have various challenges I've covered, a few things that I've not covered here, but I just wanted to, you know, say it's queuing those things is not our only challenge. Um, but we're also having successes working at NERSC, and that's going well, and I'm at my eight minutes. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. Um, so maybe we, we should go ahead and jump to Michael so we can try to stay on time as much as possible. Sure. Go ahead. Okay. Um, okay. Um, Hello everybody, my name is Michael Pote, uh, and today I'm going to be giving a talk uh, about physics data production on HPC and our experience to uh, efficiently running at scale. So I'm uh, working for the uh, STAR experiment at RIC. Um, so since uh, PDSF is end of life and we've uh, all been migrating to Cori at NERSC, we've had our ongoing efforts to get our data production to actually run on Cori. Uh, and really focusing on our containerization model, uh, the scalability of CDMFS uh, to serve our software, our workflow, uh, our database access, and efficiency. Um, so in order to run on Cori, uh, we need to have Docker or Shifter containers uh, to enable our software to run. And we found that it's best to deploy uh, minimal containers uh, with the software stack provision from CDMFS. So initially, our container model uh, had uh, our base scientific Linux 7 OS, we added our RPMs, we added our software, and one of our libraries. And we realized that we deploy about 12 to 15 new libraries every year, and this is just going to be a big mess of containers to maintain. Uh, so we went a different route by having a minimal size container with just the operating system, uh, the base OS, and uh, some of our RPMs and having CDMFS serving our software. And additionally, uh, in the past, we used to have one node that would serve our uh, database uh, on Cori while all the other worker nodes would run uh, star tasks. So we have thus combined uh, the MySQL service uh, to run along uh, the, task, the star tasks as well. So we can have everything packed in one container and 
one node could do one job without having to rely on a head node or, other, or another worker node. Uh, so CDMFS on Cori, uh, there's a fuse restriction on Cori, meaning that you cannot mount CDMFS natively. Um, so there are, uh, NERSC does provide these DVS servers that forward the IO for CDM CDMFS, uh, but they don't support metadata uh, lookups. So we wanted to uh, test this out. So we did a throughput test uh, with 15,000 tasks at 240 nodes. Uh, and if you see this little plot here, uh, the flat curve is a good sign uh, showing the number of events completed per minute. Um, but in order to achieve this flat curve, we had to modify our workflow with some time delays. So our workflow uh, looking something like this, where we launch a master script to the batch system uh, and each node that runs in the job will run our container and immediately launch uh, two scripts, one for launching the database service and one for uh, launching the uh, star software script. But both of these scripts will have uh, these sleep delays that create a load spreading effect. Uh, one for the database payload, each node is copying about 25 gig database and each node is loading the star uh, software through CDMFS. And by having the time delays creates, allows each node to not copy the same exact file at the same time. Uh, once everything is up and running, uh, we can then uh, launch our parallel uh, root for star tasks. And one thing to mention here is uh, this portion we consider our job start efficiency, which I'm going to talk about on the next slide. So uh, really we're focusing uh, for on our efficiency on Cori to get really to maximize uh, the number of events per second per dollar. Uh, so to define a few things, uh, we have our job start efficiency, which is the real time to copy the database, load the environment, the sleep delays, etc. Uh, then our event efficiency, which is the CPU uh, real time uh, of the uh, star event uh, data reconstruction tasks, and then the total efficiency, which is the slurm job start to the last task finish. So what we found uh, is that with our, with first off with having our database uh, being served, we initially had the one head node that would basically only run the database serving say 10 other worker nodes where now we're doing the one-to-one uh, -one model where the node is self-serving itself. So this really makes a big impact uh, as the one-to-one -one model, our total efficiency is 99.3%, where the one-to-eleven model will add at 89.44%, basically dedicating an entire node for that. So it's better to self-serve uh, the database. The job start efficiency, it's only a 0.05% loss. This is over a 48-hour job. So bigger the job, higher the value. Same thing with the event efficiency bigger the job, higher the value, it's 98 to 99%. And uh, what we've, since our tasks require about one gigabyte of memory uh, per task, we can't use um, uh, all the uh, CPUs uh, on a Haswell node or a KNL. So we just, we found that it's best to focus on packing the best number of tasks and focusing on how efficient uh, we can use the machine with the uh, software that we have to run. Um, so really, just to wrap it up, uh, for our containerization model, we find it's best to keep them to a minimum and having and, and leveraging CDMFS to serve our software. Uh, for the database side, since the Cori nodes are on a private network, we have to run the database locally. We're able to copy our database payload to NERSC on demand. We merge with authentication tables there, and we can uh, we can self serve. For the workflow. We, well, uh, it's best to launch uh, the database uh, environment scripts in parallel. So get everything set up as fast as you can and to start uh, doing the event processing. Uh, although we did find we need to have our time delays uh, implemented for, for uh, CBMFS. Uh, and overall for the job, for the efficiency, the job start efficiency and the idle CPU that, that we, uh, we get out when the tasks finish uh, is really a small impact, especially if we run over the whole 48 hours. Uh, and really the head node uh, model introduced our biggest efficiency because we're paying for that node to just run database. Um, and looking forward, our next steps uh, is to ensure graceful termination. So the idea of using signal handling if the tasks need to run past the 48 hour limit. Uh, there is the potential use of the burst buffer for our database content uh, and our event service uh, is coming soon that will allow us to start uh, new events, uh, new tasks uh, when, when one finishes. And uh, that's really the, the summary of, uh, of the whole talk. Thank you.
Thanks a lot, Michael. So I um, guess we should move on uh, to uh, Jeff. You're ready, you can take over the screen. Um, Michael, you need to stop sharing. Yep, I'm working on that. All right. Can I, oh, stop share, there we go. There we go. <laughs> All right, hold on a second. All right, can you see this fine? All right. Yes. Great, great. So I'm gonna be approaching a slightly different uh, 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 approach. I mean, we're looking at the challenges for integrating nurse resources into an existing uh, uh, distributed and automated data processing model that's, that's been around for, for, for many years. Uh, we're, we're, uh, Alice is a, Alice is a experiment, heavy experiment at the LHC. We have a history with, with working with nurse at PDSF. Um, and I'm just going to go quickly here. We, when, when nurse uh, introduced Corey, we put in some effort to, to try and make use of the, the system. And uh, th this is just a kind of a hodgepodge of different things that we were working on. To, to leverage the system, do some benchmarking of the, of the, of the, uh, of the resources, build a, a system that could handle, uh, could, could handle serial jobs, but combine into something that, that was more uh, fit into uh, the way nurse processes. Um, and, but in, in, in reality, four years later, uh, it's mainly used by local tasks, local groups for one-off tasks, and remains an outlier in the out system. And that's because Alice has this very specific computing model. And so the, 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 the point here was to try and figure out how do we tie directly into the uh, uh, nurse system with the Alice computing model as it exists. So just briefly, what is the Alice computing model? It's a distributed facility. It's a grid facility of about 80 sites that, are, that act together as one facility. Um, it's uh, 120,000 or more serial jobs. It runs 24 by 365 all the time. It has a 110 petabyte file system that is a distributed file system. And there's software that ties all the pieces together. And it really is a facility. You can log in, you can do LS, you can edit files, you can move files around. Uh, it does act like a facility. Um, and so well, the way you can achieve something like this is that no site is very distinctly different than any other site. That's how this, this thing is able to glue the pieces together. If every site was different, there'd be a lot of, a lot of manpower maintaining this facility as a, as a a, a unique facility. So every site runs 90% of different job types, Monte Carlo simulations and, and organized uh, data analysis. So uh, since this is the, to, to, what we look at is how do you link in a, a facility to uh, the Alice grid? Um, and I'm skipping some slides that, that were in the other um, uh, talk, but um, so there's a couple of requirements. One is at the node level um, and for the most part, uh, particularly since CVMFS has been set up and, and using Shifter for the per node cache, this is working really well at the, low, at, at the node level. There are some issues with the swap, not having swap, but that's a small issue. There's not much. And the facility level is, is, is it works pretty well. We have access to a workflow node, which is one of the critical pieces of uh, having a single contact between the facility and the rest of the Atlas grid facility. Um, and the, the, the local resource management system of Slurm works fine with us. What is not working well with us is that, is that we, we prefer a facility to be optimally configured for serial jobs. And we need long-term storage that is grid enabled, that doesn't go year to year, it goes for long-term and it's grid enabled. Uh, so, so we can kind of look at how to address those without, without disrupting the ALA's computing model. Uh, and that's the point here. Now, uh, this is just a simple cartoon of, of what happens with the Alice computing model. And you, if you just consider this as working, these are just serial jobs. It could be other people's jobs in here. The local resource management uh, manager schedules the, the job. The agent, an agent is launched and the agent's all the same. They build a wrapper and that wrapper goes and gets the payload. And the payload is d defined in the central services at NERSC, at, not, at CERN, sorry. Um, and so these, these, they are independent. They don't, they don't interact with each other. And these are the, the, the pieces that, that, that operate this, this, uh, uh, in the facility from the node level. Now, one thing we, we did was we just decided 
since we want to leverage uh, either multi-node, but whole node but multi-node scheduling, we, we figured it's something called a job runner, which is a very thin layer that actually uh, uh, combined the resources of the entire job of uh, many cores and many resources, uh, and then uh, uh, acted as a broker for those resources. So now it's a job runner that manages the node resources and launches the job agents. Uh, but the rest of it is pretty much the same. The, 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 the job wrapper still goes out and, and gets the payload and runs the job. Uh, and so this was actually um, uh, some initial funding from uh, uh, an LDRD with uh, physics and, and Zach Marshall, Marshall um, helped us put this together. So the, the, the good news is that we did this initial deployment. Um, just to give you some, some scale reference, the, the top left is the, the normal Alice grid is running 130,000 jobs. The bottom left plot shows the two um, facilities that we that are production facilities at, in the U.S. at Bridge and LBNL. They're running around 5,000 jobs. Uh, the nurse allocation, if we ran 24 by 365, is around seven or 800 jobs. Um, but so we were able to, to deploy this system and um, retain the full automatic workflow of the grid. We're, we're getting only about 100 jobs, but, but we are able to maintain the late binding, uh, the auto cleanup and resubmit on failures. We don't have to, to do anything special for failures. We, it's automatic. Um, and, it, and it's usable in serial, whole node, and even partial node uh, uh, scheduling. So this is the good news. Low resource utilization rate is something we're, we're looking at now. And that's, um, there, there's several things. I think that, that we discussed this in, during the, the talk, uh, the, the, the actual talk. So I think the main thing is that the, the, what other people have already said about the only two um, uh, nodes, um, uh, uh, two jobs are, 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 um, are used to, to, um, uh, for scheduling and the rest are just backfill. And we were using 48 hour jobs. So what we need to do is look at uh, uh, reducing the time to see if the backfill will work. Making big wide jobs is probably not the right way for our model, uh, just because we like things that are really DC, as you can see from these, these plots of, of jobs running. Uh, uh, that's typically what we, what we prefer. But this gives us something to work with, and, and, and we, we're, we're continuing on that. Uh, the other piece is the storage and how do we manage the storage. And there's some work was done uh, actually through, also through the LDRD with physics, which was to um, make, utilize that we, we do have a large grid enabled storage element at LBNL nearby NERSC, it's in a, another facility. So uh, and we can use uh, this, uh, a, something called a proxy cache uh, to access the, the, the data directly from that storage. And we, we see some market improvements on that. So, I mean, that, that's, been, that's something that we're working on in the future to really actually optimize that. Um, the effort, just as a summary, but the effort was, you know, is analysis development, but uh, the, the tar Corey was a target, was a use case. But it's, it's, uh, it was also for Alice's future, was we're getting into multi-core simulations and, and other HPC facilities really require whole node and multi-node scheduling. So this is what we we're trying to connect in without, without disrupting the, uh, the Alice workflow. And we've already seen some benefits. I mean, the, there's another uh, computer uh, at LBNL Laurentium that has uh, whole node scheduling requirements and but has opportunistic utilization. We just didn't do anything. We just turned it on and it's running fine at Laurentium. So both this activity both helps us use uh, NERSC and other sites as well. That's all I have. Great. Thanks, Jeff. All right. So next up, I think we have Chris. All right, uh, I'm speaking now, so if you can't hear me, let me know. We can hear you. Good. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to focus on one uh, particular aspect of nurse usage. Uh, which is a real-time analysis at NERSC, which turns out to be important uh, for our facility. Um, so what is our facility? It is, if this slide will advance. Uh, we're LCLS um, at the SLAC National Accelerator Laboratory. So a big, long, linear accelerator where uh, we create these short, intense bursts of X-rays. Uh, for doing photon science. Um, 
we operate uh, 24 hours a day. Um, currently, we send down uh, these short bursts of x-rays um, 120 times a second. But next year, we're supposed to go up to uh, a million times a second. And that is what drives our increased uh, interest in uh, NERSC and other facilities in the US. Um, so what do we do at LCLS? Um, well, this is what we were doing uh, yesterday and this morning, uh, roughly speaking. Um, we've been down for 18 months, uh, installing uh, new upgrades to prepare for the uh, million shots per second. Um, but we do many types of biology, chemistry, and physics. Uh, this is one of the big examples is we'll do uh, uh, nano, uh, nano, nano crystal um, uh, crystallography. So coming up with structures and the experiment which we just turned on yesterday for the first time in 18 months was imaging uh, COVID related stuff. Um, so trying to see which uh, amino acids, as I understand it, will bind to uh, the COVID protease um, and effectively try to put a, a wrench into the works of COVID so that it can't uh, reproduce itself as well. Um, yeah, so kind of work that uh, the world could use today, hopefully a little bit, um, uh, to figure out these structures of things. All right, so um, what about the real-time nature of, uh, of what we're doing? So this is a, a billion dollar facility and it runs 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, and we're gonna, currently we generate about two gigabytes a second of data and we're gonna go up to 20 gigabytes a second next year. And um, that's a challenging data volume, 20 gigabytes per second. And that's just for starters. It's supposed to go up after that. Um, we get about 200 gigabytes per second coming off the detectors, but we reduce it by a factor of 10 in real time. And here's the key point in green. Um, the um, things change all the time at LCLS. They're really kind of flying by wire. Uh, so we need real-time feedback to steer the experiments. And the experiments change dramatically uh, multiple times per week. So we have to be able to adapt very quickly to uh, changing requirements for the experiments. And this real-time data analysis feedback is critical for running these experiments. So we have kind of one second of latency uh, for um, our in-hutch analysis. This is done before the data even touches a disk. Um, we multicast the data currently and we uh, get it over InfiniBand um, before it hits the disk so we can get one second latency. Um, and that's not what I'm going to talk about here because we're not expecting NERSC to provide one second latency. But what we're trying to get from NERSC is a few minutes of latency from disk. So this is what I'm going to talk about today is getting this one minute latency. So we've been looking into this with uh, help from uh, Debbie and David Skinner and other people at NERSC um, at the possibilities from get, for getting a few minutes of latency. Um, reservations are a big one, but they're kind of inflexible. Uh, they need a day of advance notice. Um, and LCLS is just too dynamic. You know, the beam will go away for a while and then we don't need the computing. And then it comes back and then we need a ton of computing right away. And yeah, so it's too inflexible. There's the real time quality of service. Um, so the way that it's been described to me, this is like uh, oversold first class seats on airplanes. And uh, if you're fortunate enough to get one of those first class seats, you can uh, take advantage of this pool. Um, we've been approved for 20 nodes, but this is not going to scale because this pool that they have for the real-time QoS, it's not going to scale when we move to 20 gigabytes per second next year. Um, 
There just won't be enough nodes in the real-time queue for us to use. Then there's this intriguing thing, the so-called flex queue, where jobs that can checkpoint um, the density functional theory codes, I think, are the big example, like VASP and Quantum Espresso will write out their uh, wave functions every once in a while so that the jobs can be killed and they get a, a discount, these sorts of jobs, for using this flex queue so that they're willing to be killed. Um, and NERSC currently uses this to chop big jobs into small pieces to fill in the cracks in the Slurm scheduler, scheduler to try to get a, a pack all the cores that they can efficiently. So this is sort of starting to feel a little bit uh, like what we would want. We would want to be able to preempt these jobs. And then there's this effort, as I understand, um, with a DMTCP, uh, with Zhengji Zhao to make uh, all jobs um, preemptible, uh, but in the user uh, domain. So you don't have to go do weird things inside the kernel is my naive understanding of this effort. And, but it does require the user jobs to do some work to become preemptible. But then you get a discount if you're willing to do that work um, and you can save, uh, save some money. Okay, so um, the summary is the options for us, you know, the real-time quality of service is inefficient, so it's not gonna be an option for us. Um, we, uh, at LCLS, we have our own job preemption, uh, but I don't think NERSC wants to uh, suspend the jobs. They wanna kill them so they can free up all the memory. So this preemption method that we use here at uh, Slack uh, won't work at NERSC. So the flex queue is the closest to what we need, um, which receives a discount. And um, so we've been in talking with David Skinner and my understanding is that NERSC has agreed uh, to provide, to expand this flex queue idea and somehow provide us with a mechanism to preempt these preemptible jobs so that we can get our, uh, our few minute uh, turnaround time. So we can give real time feedback to the experiments. Okay, and that's, uh, that's all I have to say. Great, thanks Chris. So um, the last top that we have, talk that we have scheduled here is uh, from Bryce. Bryce, are you on? Right, so I'm not sure if Bryce is, is here. I'm trying to look for him in the uh, list and I don't see his name showing up there. So maybe he was unable to make it today. Um, in which case then, uh, I guess what I should do is probably open this up. There was a, been a little bit of um, messages going through the chat window, uh, but if anybody had any questions, maybe they wanted to bring them up here and, and ask any of the speakers or, or any of the, uh, the nurse folks who are on about it, that would be a great, Great time. Hey, David. This is um, this is Katie Antipa. So yeah, thank you again for organizing this. This was really helpful, especially because I wasn't able to attend all the weekly ones. Um, I had a, a you know a comment, and then uh, just wanted to encourage folks to for one one other item. So first is, you know, I I guess I continue to hear about job job throughput issues, um, and uh, you know I thought we had some some solutions that could work for people that were um, helpful in bundling jobs. Uh, you know, I think there's a challenge here because I can understand how if you're part of a big international collaboration, you know, it's hard to change your workflow for, for NERSC. At the same time, you know, our, our, it's true, our scheduler and I would say any HPC scheduler just will get knocked over when there's millions of jobs individually going through. And so we have to find some way to sort of meet in the middle and if that's providing more assistance for people to change their workflows. I saw something in the comments that um, Shane is working on like a Condor option. I'd like to keep keep this going. I mean, I think if if you all cannot get your jobs through through the queue, then it's, it's obviously not gonna work to run, to run it at NERSC. At the same time, you know, um, 
the current scheduler we have, and I would say every HPC center has, is uh, can't handle the, a, a flood. The second comment I wanted to make was the ERCAP season is coming up. And so I wanted to encourage all of you to make sure that you all knew about the community file system. So the community file system replaced project. Um, it's about mm, 10 times bigger or so. It's about 75 petabytes. And the storage is actually allocated and approved by your program manager. And so I, I would encourage you not to be shy in saying what you need. Um, if you need 30 petabytes of storage, I put in 30 petabytes. And I think we uh, don't want you to um, shrink your ask based on what we, you think we have, because we really need to know what, what your workflow needs. So that was just a plug. And if you have never heard of the community file system, we'll, we'll get back to you. And, and tell you more as well. So as a, maybe just as a quick follow up on that. So um, for our particular workflow, we don't need the space for very much time other than when we're trying to run it through. So um, I guess I haven't asked for really large disk space in the uh, request before because I thought, well, the file only needs to be there as long as, until the job runs and then we get the, the results back. So uh, we don't really need it to be year round mm -hmm. quota. Is there anything in between uh, or, or any option for getting, you know, scratch space that exists for a temporary amount of time? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, so the idea is you could stage into community and then go up and down to, um, to Yeah, I mean, I could, I could request a large amount, but then I feel like I'm not being a very good citizen to the rest of the NERSC users if I am get some huge quota that I just really don't need for most of the year. If you get a large quota, but you don't use it, you're not hurting nurse users. It's only if you're using that space and you never, del like never delete it. So if you have a 60, I don't know if I jumped out. Did that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. So if you have a 100 terabyte uh, quota and then you only use that once in a while, you know, on average, I mean, you're not taking out away space from, from people and, and we can kind of do an oversubscription factor. But David, what um, is there aspects about how Scratch is? Is Scratch, do you just need more space than you typically get on Scratch? Or is, what about asked, Scratch maybe doesn't work? No, we asked for a, um, a special uh, allotment that got us up to 60 terabytes. And that actually, that number came because of our bandwidth limit. We kind of, it kind of all gets tied in. How fast can we transfer data to NERSC? And then how many nodes would we be able to feed in a steady state there. So, you know, how much disk space we need really is dependent on that bandwidth and how many nodes we can expect to have at any point in time. So that's if, we change, if we change our workflow so that we say, okay, we're going to transfer the entire, you know, six or seven petabytes first before we start any jobs at NERSC, that would change everything that we do. And it would make probably simplify a lot of things on our end. Um, but that, that would be just a different way of doing it than what we have what we initially set up. Okay, thanks. So I, I have one other comment, but I want to give other people an opportunity to say something or, or ask something if they... I'll, I'll just um, chime in. So I'd mentioned this in the chat window, but yeah, I'm a nurse staff member, but I also work on a couple of other projects, and one of those is NMDC. I, I don't know what um, uh, Bryce was going to, was it Bryce that was supposed to, or was it? Yeah, Bryce is going to talk about JTM. Yeah. I, and uh, I know that they're using uh, uh, something called Cromwell. It's a way to, you can encapsulate your workflows using a sort of standard description language. And then there's a tool called Cromwell that can kind of take those in and run them. And uh, so he was probably going to talk about that. We're using this for NMDC as well, which is the National Microbiome Data Collaborative. And uh, the, I've hit some of the same issues that, uh, you know, were brought up here by others. And so, you know, even me as a nurse staff member, I see exactly the kind of things that you're, you're mentioning. And so, you know, for these particular workflows, what makes them challenging is there's a kind of an iterative aspect where it'll do some work and then it will submit jobs. The, the workflow engine, the way it wants to work is it'll run things and then it'll submit follow-up jobs as those things complete. So it doesn't like submit the entire DAG up front 
And so because of that, then the kind of turnaround time of the scheduler becomes a huge bottleneck. Now, if we submitted to the re real time queue, that would probably mostly address some of these things. But the way that I've worked around this for NMDC and JGI has a kind of a similar approach, but a different, um, a different piece of software is there's some intermediate scheduler. In my case, I'm using Condor. In their case, JGI is using something they developed internally called JTM that uses like a RabbitMQ message bus. Same kind of thing though, is like there's this intermediate queue and then the you submit jobs that basically pull off of that. And that's not too different from how some of the HEP projects work as well. So um, I do think that long-term we need to work with Slurm to figure out ways to have it more effectively deal with these things directly. Um, and I don't know exactly how that would be done. Potentially some kind of more hierarchical method might be, might work so that you could kind of have the idea of like, there's a sub, you know, there's a subset of nodes that a, another scheduler can kind of just focus on those nodes. And that might relieve some of the scaling issues that we have to wrestle with. And another thing I think that Slurm needs to deal with is really the idea of scheduling a workflow versus just scheduling tasks with a bunch of requirements. So how do you kind of treat a bundle of work as something that ages together? And even if you don't know it all up front, it can kind of um, schedule them effectively. I, I think there's opportunity sort of in both of those dimensions. Great. Very good points. So, um, so I, I guess uh, one thing I, I want to make sure uh, I uh, give full confession here uh, that uh, this time when we we started our uh, camp most recent campaign, uh, we found that we weren't able to backfill like we did last year, which really kind of worked fairly well for us. And I guess um, I didn't hear exactly what the um, uh, the improvements were, but I, I guess. Uh, Sudeep was saying this morning about uh, improvements on Corey K and L that uh, got you from mid 80s up to mid 90s, and I'm I'm gonna guess that maybe that's one of the reasons why I can't get so many in anymore. And I, and what I've done is actually made the problem worse because trying to fit into smaller jobs, I've made my jobs smaller, so now I have 10,000 jobs at once that I'm submitting, which probably just puts an even larger burden on your scheduler. So anyway, now I feel like I've cleansed myself by confessing. <laughs> okay. Well, I think we should have someone follow up with you. Um, I did notice Bryce just said he, he was here. Um, yeah, I'm still here. Ah, okay. We missed you uh, before. Um, yeah, I wasn't sure which meeting I was supposed to be in. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, sorry about that. So we only have like three minutes left here, but I'll tell you what, why don't you go ahead and give your talk and, and Anybody who wants to stay on is welcome to. I'll certainly stay on and, and, and listen to it. Uh, if you feel like you have to duck out to the uh, plenary session, then go ahead. So if you're, if you're ready, ready to share your, your slides and willing to do it. I am. Is the uh, slide showing up? Yes, I can see it. All right. So thank you, everybody, for inviting me to talk today about JGI and our, our uh, pipelines that we have. So for those of you who aren't familiar with JGI, we're a... Um, High throughput uh, sequencing facility that does DNA sequencing for uh, researchers around the world. We're looking at uh, different metabolomics and other analysis on these uh, DNA sequencers. So you can see here that we have um, our researcher, they give us DNA. Uh, we have these sequencers that are at the lab that are producing tens of terabytes of data uh, every couple of weeks. And then um, you know, we're processing it through multiple pipelines. Uh, constantly through NERSC. Um, and you can kind of see the automation here of you know, all these little outputs going into different boxes for our um, collaborators who are helping out. Uh, so last year, we had about uh, almost 2,000 users uh, actively uh, doing projects at uh, JGI. Um, we have about 16,000 different active projects. Uh, we received about 24,000 different DNA samples over the year for 2019. Uh, for we had almost 100,000 pipeline runs, and that's for RQC only. And I'm the group lead for RQC, doing all these pipeline runs for 30 different pipelines. There are a few other groups also at uh, JGI who also do um, a number of uh, pipelines, and we all uh, use NERSC pretty heavily for that. 
Um, so we have a few sequencers. So here you can see the plots of uh, our growth over time. Um, this is just since 2013. You know, it's fairly linear, but it's going up. Of course, 2020 um, is a little bit different for everybody. Uh, but you know, these things go up because every few years there's a new sequencing technology that comes out that does things uh, cheaper, faster, produces more data for us. And so we're able to accommodate more and more projects over time here. Um, our compute usage over time, you can see it's grown and then it shrank. And really that's a sign that our product mix uh, is changing a bit. We used to have uh, products which required a lot more uh, heavy compute. Um, one of the things that we did is there is something called BLAST, which is a way of aligning the sequence that you got off the sequencer with the sample that, um, or big database of samples to try to identify what it is. And uh, that was a huge compute uh, sync for us. And so we were able to replace that with something much faster and better that gave us kind of the same uh, output. Um, and of course, you know, over time, we're also looking at ways of uh, replacing older tools with newer ones like Blast, like I mentioned, to make things better for us. Um, I'm seeing chats come up, but I'm not actually following them. Um, Okay, um, all right. So for the pipelines that we run, for example, um, we run almost all the pipelines on the Cori's gene pool partition. Um, and we do this to meet our cycle time requirements. You know, we get data off the sequencer and we have to, have to really do a fast turnaround on these things, relatively fast for our users. And so they can't really be waiting weeks and weeks for uh, analysis to come through. So we actually have a dedicated partition um, on the query machines that uh, we can run things on. So our typical pipelines that we run, um, they're high memory pipelines because they're loading all the sequence data into memory. Uh, they can take anywhere from 16 gigabytes to three terabytes, depending on the pipeline uh, for memory usage. Uh, it's really heavy IO. All these files coming off of the sequencers are pretty heavy files, even when they're compressed. And we have a lot of variability in the runtime. Um, it can be five minutes depending on some pipelines, so more than seven days for other things. You can see here on the box plot on the right, um, even for some of the same pipelines, there's still a lot of variability uh, in the runtimes. And this is really product dependent. Um, not even product dependent, it's sample dependent. Some samples are a lot more complex than others and take a lot more resources uh, to run. Um, also, we've purchased uh, some nodes in Cori that are uh, 1.5 terabyte memory nodes that we use for some of our special pipelines to run. Um, and it has slightly different characteristics. But uh, yeah, we're using Cori pretty heavily for all this. So working with NERSC, um, you know, I think like everybody, we've had occasional challenges. Uh, like last year, the uh, Cray upgrade on uh, caused us some disruptions for our, our product cycle time at JGI because all sorts of things started failing and we're running slower. Uh, but you know, we worked with NERSC and uh, NERSC has agreed to help us by running some reframe tests whenever uh, they're going to do some of these upgrades so that we can potentially get ahead of some of these problems. Um, you know, over time, it seems like the query file system uh, performance is unstable. You know, when DVS goes down or when DVS is slow, you know, it does take us time to go into pipelines and say, okay, what happened wrong here? Was it actually a problem with the data, a problem with the pipeline, or was it something with the query file system? And a lot of times it seems to be more of a query file system issue. Um, as for Perlmutter GPUs, uh, we did have a hackathon, I believe it was May 2019, where we worked at um, taking some bioinformatics code and trying to port it over to GPUs and seeing what kind of performance increase we would get. You can see here on the lower left here, kind of a timing slide. And the green here is essentially the NVIDIA uh, GPU results. And you can see they're not better than running on CPUs. The difference between the blue bars and the purple bars here is really just using um, the optimized flag for C that uh, isn't done by default and by turning it on, um, we already got a huge uh, improvement without doing much for the code. But anyways, it was interesting that a lot of bioinformatics software that uh, people tried to uh, port over at the hackathon 
didn't see a huge amount of GPU acceleration. Um, I'd also want to say that, you know, JJ and analysts really like the Jupyter notebooks that NERSC provides and they use them regularly. That's a really nice feature that we have. And um, we have a program called MetaHitMer that several JJ staff are working on. And that's a assembler that does a huge assembly that takes three terabytes of memory and multiple nodes to take a huge amount of data and try to assemble it to get out an assembly from it. And we've been able to um, get that somewhat running on the query cluster and there's actually a paper published for that in nature.com. Um, so that's really the last of my slides I was um, working through here because I know I didn't have much time, but um, questions or uh, other things I can answer for people. Okay, thanks a lot, Bryce. So yeah, if anybody has any final questions or, or comments they wanna share, uh, we're kind of over time a little bit on the session, but now's your chance. I want to give another shout out to David for organizing this, this sequence. This has been really great. Uh, well, very welcome. I guess I should also uh, very much thank all the people at NERSC. I mean, Katie was the first person, person who initially suggested this. So, uh, so I have to uh, thank her for that and for all the support we've gotten from the NERSC staff on this whole thing. So the last, I'll, I'll just take the last word here and say, if you know of any other projects or any other person who may be working on something at NERSC that is kind of relevant to this, please let me know. Uh, you can send me their name. I can anonymously uh, or not to, or prod them to come give a talk to us and, and not bring your name into it if you want. Uh, but it would be good to, uh, to get a few more talks together, I think, because I, I found this very, very useful. So uh, with that, Thank you guys very much. And I guess we can all jump back over to the, the main session. Great, thanks yeah. a lot. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, thanks everybody. everybody. Bye, everyone.